Greetings and salutations, my friends, and welcome to a new video. Now, I know as I am uploading this, it is the end of October. The month is basically over at this point, and we have exactly a month left of fall. I also love that every time I say fall, I rope myself into that statement. I've talked about this before. I make my own fall, baby. Living in a country that has no more than two seasons, which are comprised of summer and rain, I literally have to make up my own seasons because otherwise I don't get anything else. So as we together collectively reach the end of fall, I thought I'd hop on here and show you guys 10 different book recommendations that I think are absolutely perfect for fall. And honestly, all of these reads would make an amazing transition into the winter. I've talked about this before, but when I think of fall and winter, I think of very atmospheric reads. I know a lot of people associate the fall specifically with spookier thriller mystery horror reads. I don't really associate it with much outside of whatever I am in the mood for. And I also don't tend to lean very horror thriller to be with. So you'll see that all of these reads are leaning more fantasy sci-fi than anything else, which is honestly very exciting to me. I know a lot of people also associate the end of year with fantasy and sci-fi. So hopefully you guys can still get a wreck out of this list. I do have two mysteries. So let's count those as our honorary thriller, mystery, horror, intersectional reads, because outside of that, I really cannot provide much. However, all of these books I have read this year, except for one that I did read, I think it was two years ago and for some reason I have never recommended it on my fall recommendations list even though this book is perfect for the fall season and essentially when I was reading all of these I kept thinking this would make an amazing end of year read especially for the people that do have this kind of weather and this type of season so friends I hope you're ready to cozy back and get some book recommendations hopefully you guys have not read all of these and you can still get something out of the video let a girl know if you've read any of these let a girl know if you're planning on picking any of these up before the end of fall and also if you have got any other fall book recommendations do let us know in the chat in the comment section if we will because I'd love to know what books you guys associate with this time of year and maybe what other recs you guys can give out to people that may be looking for other reads so make sure to drop that all in the comments and let's get into it but before we get started with today's video I do have to give a massive shout out to HelloFresh for partnering with me today one thing I love is making restaurant style meals at home without having to worry about high price tags delivery fees or wait time and HelloFresh makes it super easy by delivering pre-portioned ingredients to my doorstep from the proteins to the veggies all the way to spices and sauces alongside step-by-step -step instructions so I can eat the most delicious meals at home. They always keep it exciting with over 50 recipes each week as well as offering over 100 market add-ons like desserts, breakfast, and snacks if you'd like to get even more out of your box. What I personally love about HelloFresh is how convenient and easy it is. I know I'm getting the exact amount of ingredients I need, the recipes keep the week exciting and easy to follow, and it gets me excited since I know which recipe I'm cooking next. This time I made some salsa verde enchiladas and I seriously never tire of these. At this point it's one of my go-to recipes from HelloFresh because it is fresh, the cleanup is extremely easy, the balance of flavors goes from cheesy to spicy with layered seasonings, and I love it. If you'd like to check HelloFresh out for the first time, you can get 10 free meals at HelloFresh.com by using code MALREADS10. It applies across seven boxes for new subscribers and will vary by plan. That is 10 free meals at HelloFresh.com with MelRates10. Don't say I didn't tell you. We are first going to start out with a series that is currently ongoing, so it's not completed. But you can still kind of count this as a duology so far. And I am talking about A Psalm for the Wild Build by Becky Chambers. I recently read both of these books and absolutely fell in love with this world. Absolutely fell in love with the characters, with what it explores and what it establishes thematically. The overall series dealing a lot with having to disconnect from the world and loneliness and found family, finding yourself amidst being incredibly lost and how you get to that point, but it's still all being very hopeful. To me, screams a gloomy day type of read during the fall going into winter. In the Monk and Robot series, we primarily follow sibling Dex, who wants to fully disconnect from city life. They find that they are completely overwhelmed by the notion of going into work and socializing and living up to all these different expectations that come with living in a capital, living in a city, living in a very crowded place where everything is moving incredibly fast. And they decide last minute, very impulsive, 
compulsively almost, that they want to become a tea monk and essentially travel through the outskirts of towns and cities in order to provide tea services for people. Sibling Dyke does so, hops on a bike and starts pedaling away, and in the midst of doing so, they actually encounter a robot. Machines and robots a while ago decided to lay down their tools and completely emancipate themselves from humanity. They did so very peacefully and they have lived off in the forest, in the woods, isolated from humankind for a really long time now. And this is where we insert our second character, Moscap, a robot who has been tasked with first contact with humans and to ask whatever human it encounters first the very important question of what exactly humankind needs. They quickly realize, both Sibling Dex and Moscap, that there is simply no simple answer to this and it's very nuanced and it'll definitely vary person to person. And so these two embark on this journey of finding out exactly what it is that humans need whilst also falling in love with life from the ground up. Sibling Dex gets to see things that they've never seen before, breathe fresh air and see bugs and populous trees, beautiful lakes and wildlife, as well as Moscap encountering humans for the very first time in its life and getting to realize that there is so much more to life than it has been realizing there is to. Once more, it's so good. It's so easy to fall in love with these characters. It was honestly so beautiful in ways that I couldn't have even anticipated when I picked this series up. And now it's safe to say that I'm obsessed. I can't wait for the next book to come out whenever it does. I don't think there's an announcement for it quite yet, but these two brought me so much joy these past couple of weeks and they're super short too. So they're really quick reads and you can honestly binge the two of them and it's essentially like a single full-length novel and it's a great time. I don't talk about this book nearly enough for how much I loved it and I keep saying it, if you enjoyed movies like The Orphan, which have got very psychological thriller vibes that'll continue to mess with you the more that you read, it'll make you question reality, not know where you're standing, not know where the characters are standing, you'll be making theories along the way to try and figure this mystery out before the main character does, then I personally think you should be picking up The Push by Ashley Audrain. This book was truly sensational. I read this, I think, about two years ago, if not fully two years ago, and I really, really enjoyed the way that the author navigates the theme of motherhood and all of its darker aspects, exploring themes of postpartum depression, what exactly it looks like when you don't really form a connection with your child. Is that something that can still develop through time, or is it something that inherently needs to happen as soon as the child is born? When you have got that woman's motherly intuition that something is wrong and people don't believe you, does that mean that you are seeing something that other people are not? Or does that mean that you are fully giving in to these darker thoughts in your head that may not all be real? And I really love the way that the book pushes you further into the story the further you get along, in a way where you also don't know what the heck is happening and what's real and what's not. So I really loved the psychological trippiness of it all. I think it was beautifully done. We follow our main character, Blythe, who is a newfound mother, and she has always had this notion in her head of what motherhood will look like for her. As somebody whose mother was not really present, and when she was, it didn't exactly look the prettiest, she's always wanted to be that mother that she never had when she finally does have her children. And so when she does have her first daughter, she realizes very quickly that things are not all what they seem, and that actually something is very wrong. As she starts relaying all of these different things to her husband, Fox, he has a completely different notion of this child and of this relationship in general. He doesn't seem to believe Blythe. In fact, he dismisses her a lot and tries to pass off all of these ideas that Blythe is vocalizing as complete and utter horseshit. And then she has her second child and it sort of solidifies a lot of the ideas that she had. Her connection with these two different children are completely different. And the more she dives into motherhood, the more she'll realize exactly what's going on. And I really love that the biggest theme of the story really is what exactly happens when women are not believed, especially when the allegations being made do have a solid base to them. I continue to love this book and I seriously need to start talking about it more because this again took me on a whole trip that I wasn't expecting but one that I am not complaining about because this is the type of thriller, mystery, psychological moment that I am very much into so I definitely recommend. Perhaps a little bit of a less serious read but also if you're in the mood for a steamy vampire werewolf romance. I highly recommend Bride by Ali Hazelwood. I know I'm not the only one. Everybody raved about this book when it came out and so I joined the train. I absolutely adored this one and I hope to see more of Ali Hazelwood in this paranormal romance fantasy realm because I think she did a really wonderful job at balancing the romantic elements of the story with then the world building for the vampires and the 
werewolves and exactly what that landscape looks like in her specific world. In this one, we follow Misery, who is the daughter of a very powerful vampire councilman. She has lived with humans for a really long time as the vampire collateral, meaning that if vampires were to ever step out of line, then humans could do with her whatever they saw fit as punishment for their misgivings. And at the start of the book, we see Misery in a very particular situation where she now has to marry and form an alliance, Lo, who is the alpha werewolf who would like to engage in anything but a marriage with a vampire, specifically because of how this event has gone down in the past, because this is not the first attempt. However, after they strike this marriage of convenience, which really is convenient for the both of them, Misery starts figuring out that there is actually a lot that he can provide her in terms of answers, relating to a little mystery that happens at the start of the book. And they also realize very quickly that despite them knowing the stereotypical things about each other's kind, they really don't know the basis of it because there's been such high tension between these two species for so long that for their kind specifically, there is no way of telling truth from lie and fact from fabrication. And so as they continue to get to know each other and as Misery immerses herself deeper into werewolf life and territory, she figures out that there is actually so much more to this whole thing than she ever expected and that maybe it's not so bad after all. I think their connection was fantastic. I love that it really was a slow burn. It took us quite a bit of time into the story for them to even contemplate the idea of getting together. It seemed that it was so much more about debunking both of these ideals that they have of each other where they even get together. And I really did appreciate that because often characters will get together and there will be misunderstandings and it'll be really frustrating. But with this one specifically, I think the legwork really was done for the most part before the two even get together. Once more, even the politics of the vampires and how everything operates, I thought was super fascinating. And even in ways reminded me of one of my favorite vampire movie franchises, Underworld. And so I really liked the aesthetic of it, the way that the story moves along. The side characters were also doing a great job at providing comedy and tension into the story, which I also really enjoyed. There was honestly very little of it that I was like, mm, I think it could have been done better. I think for Ali Hazelwood's first dip into the fantasy or romance world, I think she did fantastic and I cannot wait for book two. So very excited about it. I think it's going to be great. We obviously will follow different characters, but I am not mad about that. I think it's going to be fantastic. So if you haven't picked this up yet, I'm just saying, what are you doing? Another book I have been speaking a lot about recently here on my channel because I just have not been able to stop talking about it because it really was that good. And that is A Curious Beginning by Deanna Rayborn. I was charmed off my pants by this book. I had never experienced a Deanna Rayborn book. This was my very first one. And I am not mad about it because now I want to read more. I want to continue the series, obviously, keep learning more about Veronica and Stoker and see exactly where the story takes them and their relationship and also their individual characters. If you're a fan of BBC's Sherlock and in general, the Sherlock and Watson vibes, I think A Curious Beginning is something that you could really, really enjoy as well. This book specifically starts when Veronica Speedwell has to bury her spinster aunt, who is the person she has lived with for the majority of her life. Veronica herself is considered a sort of spinster because she has lived her life to the fullest, but also by her own rules. She travels from country to country, city to city, to further her studies and really immerse herself into the sciences that she loves. And at the start of the book, she is nearly killed and she has to run away with a baron who allegedly will help her find the truth of her existence, exactly why her parents were never in the picture. And he deems the best way to do this is to actually leave her with one of his trusted friends, Stoker, who's basically the only person he trusts to not only take care of her, but to also be straightforward, honest, and honorable because he has never known him to break a promise. Yet, when these two get together, Stoker and Veronica, they are faced with a surprising murder mystery that neither of them thought was on the table. And now together, these two unlikely people will have to figure out said mystery, exactly how they're both tied to it, and also figure out the mystery behind Veronica's life. The story goes from there, and there are loads of moving parts involved in this, including a traveling circus and a knife stunt scene, which I thought was incredible. And once more, these two people being academic rivals, but also intellectual equals, just work so well for the story overall. These are both people that are more concerned with furthering their studies and science and their own personal agendas over anything romantic or relationship related. And so that's why they work so well. And that's why the tension is so good. It's because, you know, neither of these people are looking to get into something, but through seeing each other's real selves, they end up getting into a little bit of something. Nothing truly romantic happens in this first book, though I know 
it'll happen later on in the series, which is something I'm very much looking forward to. Each book in the series also establishes its own insular case to figure out, which I also think is very exciting. So I think there's much to look forward to in terms of the overall series, though this first installment really sets it up so nicely. It's such a good time. One Dark Window by Rachel Gillig is next, and I think if there is any book that screams fall, it is likely this one. Not only in its dark, almost gothic fairy tale aesthetic, but also in the way that the book moves. I found it to be incredibly unique and standing on its own in comparison to a lot of other things, not only on my shelves, but that I have also seen be released as of recent. In this one, we follow our main character, Elspeth Spindle, who has been infected by a plague that has been outlawed by the king himself. Every single person touched by this plague must be terminated, and so Elspeth, alongside her family, need to pretend like she actually actually was not touched at all, and if people do know that she was touched, then they have to really stand by the belief that Girly Pop did not acquire any special abilities or powers by being touched by it. Except that, unbeknownst to her own family, she did. And now she lives with this mercurial spirit in her head that she calls the Nightmare, the very creature or entity that provides her with its power whenever she needs it, at a very special cost every single time. The story gets more interesting, however, when she ends up meeting a group of highwaymen who are very clearly in a ploy against the king to eradicate said plague before he can do so himself. Things get even more complicated when she finds out that some of these people may be closer to the king than meets the eye, and things go from there. This truly has got one of the most unique magic systems I have seen. It is all based around tarot cards, and these very specific cards called providence cards are essentially something that anybody can use, so you don't need to have powers or abilities yourself in order to wield them, but they do cost you something once you do use them, and that's something I love. I love that this ability is not unique to certain individuals, and therefore it is more of a widespread thing. There is an entire lore behind why these cards exist, how they should be used, which made the story even richer and more complex the more that you go along. I love that our main character, Alpsbeth, has got this entity inside her head that essentially manipulates her and speaks in riddles that she doesn't understand. I love that the rest of the cast of of characters have got their own set of motivations as to why they are doing what they are doing, and all of them have got intricate life stories that make them feel like much more fleshed out characters that continue to contribute to the story the more it also moves along. We've got two separate romances in here, so we have couple A and couple B, which I also think made the story even more amazing in terms of the romantic tension, and the world building itself is truly something that stole my breath away. Again, the perfect book for fall. It is a duology, so it really is not that hard to read. I found myself wanting to binge the books just because book one ends on a cliffhanger, so also another series that I think you'd be able to binge and read quite quickly because it grips you literally from start to finish, and it's amazing. I would not recommend the audiobook, but I would definitely recommend maybe setting a nice little ambiance in the background while you read this. I was listening to a Hosey Air song, so maybe that's what I would personally recommend. Song of Nyx is what I listened to as I was reading this, and I would definitely recommend you do so as well because not only am I biased towards my my baby daddy, <laughs> but also because it really sets the vibe accordingly, and I just had that on loop. Next up, I have got Our Wives Under the Sea by Julia Armfield. This truly was another trippy sort of book. This is one of those books that makes you also question everything from start to finish. Half the time, you kind of don't even know what's actually happening and whether things are happening in reality, or if all of these things are happening inside the character's head, so sometimes it's even hard to distinguish the limitations of reality and and not, but I honestly loved it. It's such a depthful book. It's not just what you see on the surface. I feel like it's one of those stories where you can read in between the lines and you can make up your own meaning as you go because so much of it is up to the reader's interpretation. And I really do love when stories do that and give the reader so much agency so as to figure out for themselves exactly what is happening the more that you read the story. And in this one, we follow a married couple, Leah and Miri. Miri, who has stayed behind whilst Leah went on a sea expedition. Except except that while Miri is waiting for Leah to come back home and things get progressively tense because she leaves for a really long time, in fact, a longer time than she was expecting, in fact, it gets to the point where they deem her missing, Leah ends up coming back home, surprisingly, nobody was expecting her to, but she comes back changed. She doesn't come back the same Leah that left for this expedition, and Miri now has to mourn her wife, essentially, as she takes care of her and as she tries to figure out exactly what happened while her wife was gone, because her wife is not 
really vocalizing what happened during the expedition. And it makes it increasingly harder for Miri to either empathize with Leah or to also understand what's happening. And so it has this almost sense of inevitability and impending doom the more that you read it, because you really can't see a way out of this. You can't see exactly how these characters will get themselves to a similar point as they were when they initially met each other, or even right before Leah leaves on said expedition. And I think it's so fascinating how the author paints it all, because again, it's almost like Miri has to stay in the present and reconcile both of these Leahs that she has got, the one that she had before, the one that she has now, and sort of battle herself out in not getting to a place of understanding, but also needing to be empathetic to this person that she loves, but does she even love this person despite her not being the same person she had before? And having to figure out all of these complicated feelings whilst also reminiscing about what was and what could be but isn't, it's such a human and complex narrative, which I really, really enjoyed. I think it's one of those books that really sits and settles. The more time passes after you have finished it, it's a love story, but there's nothing really romantic about it, but the entire thing feels romantic. Having to take care of somebody who looks very different takes a certain level of loyalty and compromise that you wouldn't necessarily find for somebody that you didn't love. And I love the way that it captures human emotion and all of its complexities and how often, while things may be complicated, the human brain overcomplicates everything. It is just such a good narrative. I cannot talk good enough things about this. When you start getting into the question of, so what was the experiment for Leah? Was the experiment and the thing that they were observing when they went under on the sea expedition, whatever lied at the bottom of the ocean? Or was it them, the crew, that was the experiment observing how exactly they would go about surviving the situation? And why even was the ship fully stocked of all the things they would need when they were only going to be there for a handful of days, and yet there was overstock that would last them for the entirety of their unexpected stay under the sea, under the ocean. I don't even know where the heck they went, but I just know that it was crazy. And so I really loved this one, and I would love for everybody to read it so we can gush about it. Would it even be a fall book recommendation video if I was not talking about A Tempest of Tea by Hafsa Faisal? This book was an absolute hit. You guys know I read We Hunt the Flame a while back. Absolutely loved it. I still have yet to read We Free the Stars to finish out that duology, but I will very soon. This one, though, has vampire secret societies. You have got a tea house that turns into a blood house by dark. You have got a heist. You have got a group of thieves. You have got unlikely alliances. It literally is the best of everything combined. We follow our main character, Arthi, who runs a tea house by day. However, said tea house illegally turns into a blood house by dark, eating all of those low-end vampires that high society and its club, the Ethereum, would not typically feed. However, as all things go, something mad happens and Arthi now has to fight for the safety of her establishment, but also of her patrons. And so she has to figure out this very intricate heist inside the Ethereum, said High Society Vampire Club, in order to get a very specific artifact while she's there, but she cannot do so alone. So she'll enlist the help of her sort of adoptive brother, alongside other people and allies that she has worked with in the past, to pull this heist off. Things don't end there, though, because there is a very dangerous conspiracy that Arthi is very near to unearth because of said heist. So there is multiple layers to this thing and exactly how much it uncovers and how much exactly it messes things up. And all of it kept me on the edge of my seat. The last hundred pages of this book are crazy. The twists and the turns and the reveals had me absolutely gagged. Things that I probably should have considered at some point in the story and yet I didn't, which is why it shocked me by the end. I was gripped from start to finish. Laith is my absolute favorite. Him and Arthi just, ugh, if that is not endgame, y'all, I will seriously lose my mind when the second book comes out. Anytime that Hafsa posts a little something like, oh my god, this is me in real time drafting, the lengths I would go through to be a fly on the damned wall, to be able to sit on that laptop screen, to see exactly what is happening in book two, I cannot say that about many other books, but I will say it about this one, because I need to know how this whole thing will end. You have got a sassy vampire, you have got a girl who does amazing forgeries, who's also kind of in love and crushing on Arthi's adoptive brother, who does all of her dirty work for her because he doesn't want her to get her hands dirty, but then he also has thoughts and opinions on it. Six of Crows wishes, that's all I'm gonna say, and I know it's a controversial take, but as somebody who did not like Six of Crows, this is the one, baby. It's all good! 
Another book I think would be absolutely perfect for the fall is Mort by Terry Pratchett. This book took me by surprise as well. I did not think I would like the comedy and almost campiness of the Discworld. And I was recommended I start with this one first because everybody was like, oh my God, I think you'd really enjoy it. I Googled it. I searched for my options. I read synopses and excerpts and I did the whole thing to figure out where exactly I wanted to start. And I fell in love with Death as a character, Mort as a character, and exactly how both of their stories converge into this really outrageous yet very wholesome thing. In this one, we follow Mort, who has been deemed the failure of his family, of his town. Nobody really wants him around because they know that if he is around, then things will go very array. And he ends up going to this job fair that he has very little to no hope that he'll get a job at. However, by the end of said fair, he is approached by Death, who very unlikely is offering him a job. This is not something that Death has ever done before. In fact, everybody in Death's inner circle is extremely surprised when they see Mort and they find out exactly why Mort is around to begin with. And Death is essentially hiring him as his apprentice. And so now Mort has to embark on this journey of figuring out exactly what Death's role is in the disc world and exactly what it means to assume this role if it were to ever come and how exactly he needs to help out. What I love about the narrative is that both of these characters stand something to learn as we go about the narrative. We have got Mort who really finds his voice and his agency the more that the story moves as somebody who has always been told what to do and has always been talked down to because of his bad luck and his laziness and all of these different things that have been manifest in his life in the past. He truly comes into his own by becoming an apprentice while Death wants to seek out a better understanding of humanity and exactly what makes humankind as complex as it is. And we see Death going through these very mundane tasks and these very mundane cycles for him to understand the joy in the little things, why humans interact so closely with each other, why exactly certain things are important from day to day. And I love the way that all of that comes together in the story and how, again, sometimes it gets really outrageous and campy as I know the disc world to be, whilst also having these more intimate, heartfelt moments that allows us to understand these characters. And I can't wait to see more of it. I definitely want to keep on going with this series, or I guess this sub-series in the Discworld, because it's series within series. I really loved this one. I think it was lovely. And it's such a short little read for the fall that I think would be great. I've also sampled the audiobooks. Audiobooks are fantastic, so I would definitely recommend if you're looking for maybe a short little audiobook to listen to. It's fantastic. The best mystery you could read during this time of year is Vera Wong's Unsolicited Advice for Murderers. Come on now. I can't remember if this was the very first book I read this year, but I know it was one of the first few I read this year, and I have not stopped thinking about it. I have been begging the universe, the ether, Jesse, the author, forever this entire year for this to have actually been a series, because if there was just even an iota of a possibility that anybody would listen, I would take it. And you know what? A sequel has been confirmed, and I have never been more excited about anything in my life. That's a lie. There have been plenty of things I've been really excited about, but this also, I'm very excited about. I can't wait to see where the characters will go in this second installment, and how the story for this found family will continue to develop because I think it's gonna be great. So in this one, we follow Vera Wong, a 60-year-old woman. She owns her own tea shop. She is a tea expert or so she deems herself. And she also does her bout of sleuthing online. She loves looking at different true crime cases and unsolved mysteries because she thinks that there is nobody better than her to put these together and solve said cases. Things become a lot more real, however, when she gets to her tea shop one morning and she actually finds a dead body smack down the middle. And as the police comes to investigate and take samples and figure out what exactly happened while Vera was sleeping, she also figures out that who better to put this mystery together and solve said case than a 60-year-old woman who has got nothing better to do with her time seemingly than investigate unsolved cases. But things are not so simple. There are people walking in and out of her establishment, people coming in claiming that they are from news outlets or that they had some semblance of connection to the deceased and that they want to interview her or see the space or also figure out what happened. And through this, Vera essentially builds her own little crew of people, her own found family that will walk this journey with her and all together will figure out what exactly happened and why this person was found dead. Was this person murdered? Did this person just drop dead out of nowhere? Because there are always things that go deeper than what meets the eye and nobody knows it better than Vera Wong. I thought 
this was so charming. Vera as a main character is so deeply hilarious. She's playing matchmaker half the time and I absolutely love her for it. Seeing her passion for making other people feel welcome and included and loving to socialize, especially because her familial life is very tense and she doesn't have the best relationship with her son specifically. I love seeing her be in her element and really investigating everything and doubting everybody around her and trying to put this whole thing together. It is just absolutely lovely. You will laugh the whole way through. I sobbed at the end, which I really was not expecting. And if you're also looking for a really great audiobook, I think Vera Wong is one of the best audiobooks I have ever listened to. And I don't say that lightly. This truly was such a joy to listen to. I absolutely loved it. And in general, a really well-built murder mystery. It's so cozy. Again, screams fall to me personally. It'd be a great one to pick up. And last but not least, I have got Throne of the Fallen by Carrie Maniscalco, another book that I think is perfect for the end of year, but specifically for the fall. And at the start of the story, we see how Prince Envy gets this invitation to a deadly game that will help him restore his court to the power it once had and the glory it once saw. Things are not looking so well because of past decisions that he has made. His power is not only diminishing, but so is the power of his court. So he really figures that this is the one way to make sure that everything goes back to normal. However, as part of his journey, he ends up encountering a human by the name of Camille, who is a painter. Some way, somehow, both of these tasks are related, the meeting of said person, as well as the deadly game he is playing, and he needs to commission a very specific piece from her that she is not so willing to make because she knows how dangerous it is. Down the line, Camila does see a certain appeal to actually working with Prince Envy, especially after a notorious rake starts taking a lot of interest in her. And so these two people will form an unlikely alliance in order to help each other out with their desired tasks. And the story goes from there. I really loved the world building in this one. And I love how the world building is not sacrificed for the sake of the romance, which it often can be in fantasy romance books. And so I think it had a really great balance between that well-constructed world building and then the atmosphere of it all. And then also the romance bit, whilst also having really great character work. We get to understand both of our characters deeply, their own set of motivations, and we get to understand why exactly both of these people are so closed off initially, because there is more to it than meets the eye. I also love that Camila, as our main character, is not your typical heroine. She doesn't rely on heavy swords or any sort of hand-to-hand -hand combat in order to present herself as a strong heroine. She relies heavily on other talents like painting and the magic that comes with it, as well as her intellect to walk herself into and out of situations as well as save Prince Envy time and time again, which I also really enjoyed. The chemistry and tension and banter between these two characters made perfect sense to me. And I love how the more that the story develops and the more slow burn it gets, because it really takes us a while to get there, the better it becomes when they finally do get together. It just feels all the more rewarding. And the twists and turns in this were so good. Things that I was not at all expecting. I was gooped and gagged the entire time and I loved it. I can't wait for the sequel of this standalone series. It literally just came out not too long ago. I, of course, did order it, so it should be on its way to me soon, and I can't wait to have it in my hands. I ordered the Barnes & Noble exclusive edition to match my first one. I love the color of it. It's like a light baby blue. Oh my god, it looks so good. Can't wait to have it on my hands. Can't wait to read it. Can't wait to enjoy it. I think it's gonna be a great time if this first one was anything to go by, and this literally redeemed the Kingdom of the Wicked series for me because I really did not like it. And so that's it, friends. 10 different book recommendations or recommendations. I never know how to say it. I feel like I try and pronounce it different ways and it just doesn't want to roll off the tongue. I know a lot of people are like, oh my god, you pronounce it weird. Why do you pronounce it like that? And I'm like, lick it up, baby. What's the problem? Anyways, that said, <laughs> I hope there is something in here that maybe you can pick up that you have never read before. I think all of these books have immaculate vibes for the end of year. We have got, we collectively, okay, we have got exactly a month left to fall. So you still have a month to pick up maybe some of these, maybe one of these maybe two of these. You never know. You may end up finding a new favorite book. So if you do end up picking any, do let a girl know. If you've already read any, do let a girl know. And if you have any other recommendations for the fall season, also let a girl know in the comments. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. And if you reach the end, let us leave some fall related emojis. Whatever you associate with the fall, maybe it could be a witch emoji. Maybe it could be a pumpkin emoji. Maybe the fall leaves. Anything and everything you associate with this time of year, do leave it as an emoji down in the comments if you reach the very end. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already for more content like this. And if you'd like to support the channel further, I do have a Patreon.
Patreon, it's always linked down below. It's massive help toward keeping this thing running smoothly, getting expensive equipment, and things that are needed for the everyday operations of it all, so you do get a ton of things in return by supporting the channel. You get reading sprints, different live shows for movie nights, game nights, to catch-ups and hangouts. You get a Discord server, you get different book clubs, so if you're ever looking to support the channel further, that is always linked down below. I love you guys so, so much, and I will see you on the next one. Goodbye!